tuning in. Welcome one, welcome all to Cedar Lee Radio, your guide to films playing in the art house world. Thank you for tuning in the week of October 19th to October 25th. My name is Aaron Spears. I'm the house manager here at the Cedar Lee Theater. And I'm Dave Huffman, director of marketing for Cleveland Cinemas. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing Free Solo, which opens here at the Cedar Lee on Friday. We'll also be discussing some Cedar Lee buzz on the films we are currently playing. We're going to check in with the specialty box office, a little Amazon versus Netflix conversation, also some Rotten Tomatoes versus Metacritic. And inspired by Free Solo, we'll be discussing our favorite films driven uh, about driven or obsessed characters. But first, we always like to start the show with the last scene. So Dave, what is the last film you've seen? Uh, the last film I saw is, uh, is an Australian comedy called Kath and Kim Dorella. It, uh, if you've ever heard of the Australian sitcom Kath and Kim, it was one of the big screen films that they did. Kath and Kim was adapted into a terrible sitcom here in the U.S., I believe starring Molly Shannon, maybe. Uh, but the original Australian one is really funny. It's very broad. It's very just silly. And, and they're kind of great caricatures and monster women. Very funny. And uh, the film had, you know, like most TV shows that get adapted into movies, there are parts of it that are really funny. But as a film, it wasn't like the best film. But there were definitely some hilarious moments that I completely enjoyed. And I've got a new quote that I'll be uh, busting out all the time from that movie. So Kath and Kimberly, or Kinderella, uh, available on Netflix. I watched uh, West of Memphis, a documentary oh, from 2012 yeah. mm -hmm. uh, directed by Amy Berg, which I've seen a bunch before. But not being a huge horror fan, usually mm -hmm. around Halloween, I watch a lot of like true crime documentaries, right. you know, real life horror. Yeah. And uh, I'd seen this one before. It's one of my uh, favorite, very watchable documentaries because mm -hmm. it's uh, the West, West Memphis Three sure. trial. And there's been documentaries, the uh, Joe Berlinger, uh, Bruce Sanofsky films mm -hmm. uh, that were on HBO, the Paradise Lost series. Yep. And this is a good just sort of encapsulation of the entirety of it. And it does uh, end in a very satisfying kind of uh, thin yeah. blue line kind of way where, right. you know, justice kind of is, is – well, they're out of jail is the point. Yeah. But uh, right. it's yeah. a really interesting watch. And there's so many ins and outs in that case. I forget. I mean, I've seen this movie probably four or five times now but right. i always forget all the little details so it's a great film and an amazing story i've seen all of those west memphis three um the paradise lost the, ones paradise lost films and yeah. all that stuff yeah so it's it's very um yeah it's amazing you know it makes you angry and all the the true crime docs that are kind of peppered all over netflix and all these other places right now i actually yeah. i actually get a little um annoyed by them in some ways because i do feel like we're sort of like fetishizing you know ultimately there's a victim at all of these things so yes. like people have kind of turned murder into entertainment kind of thing um which is of course we, we are americans and we right. you know our violent <laughs> culture but you know it's i like the ones where it's about you know a clear injustice and trying to um do something you know or get some justice served finally right even though it takes way too long sometimes well it's also uh both of us being you know huge film geeks it's it's the power of of film and the power of story mm -hmm. to really compel people to right act in the real world to seek justice. Uh, Damien's, uh, Damien Eccles wife, I'm drawing a blank on her name right now, but she was compelled through the Paradise Lost documentaries and, mm -hmm. you know, found the world found out about that case through those documentaries right. for the most part. And mm -hmm. so that, that does speak to the power of film and documentary when yep. telling a compelling story. Absolutely. Uh, the buzz at Cedar Lee this weekend it was one of those jam-packed weekends again where we opened <laughs> four new films. Uh, yes. First Man, Colette, The Old Man and the Gun, and Tea with the Dames. Colette... I was waiting to hear people's reaction to Kira Knightley's performance, and most of the buzz was just like, Kira Knightley doesn't age. <laughs> Which, you know, they're not what wrong, but. <laughs> what a wonderfully sexist thing to say. Yeah, and I was yeah. just like, well, all right, well, you're not wrong, but, you know, what does that have to do with this? <laughs> no. you know, how's the story? How's the performance? Uh, um, that's hilarious. A Star is Born, though, is still just a uh, yeah. big hit right now. Right. No, and people are coming out of that. Everyone you know, wants to see. Mm -hmm. Crying, laughing. Um, there's, a, there's a thing that I wanted to mention real quick that. I never thought about it until I was working at a theater, but I'm so sick of that music already. You see the movie and it <laughs> yeah. works great because it's, a, you know, it's good music and, right. uh, you know, they're, uh, she's a very talented singer and she does a different variety of music within the movie. But being somebody who works at the theater, I'm hearing the shallows, uh, you know, four times a shift working there full time. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. like that radio hit that you got sick of back when terrestrial radio was still a thing people listened to. The other one, uh, First Man, which plays a little bit into what we'll be talking about today with Free Solo and our topic of, you know, driven or obsessed characters. Mm -hmm. 
the way that you can get drama out of a story that everyone knows the ending to right. is really fascinating to me. And First Man is a really good example of did, that. Did you see it? I did, yes. Yeah, I saw it as well this weekend. And I thought uh, the same thing. I'm like, well, clearly we know he's not going to die in this scene because right. we know who he is. So, yes. but you know, but there's still this tension in these mm -hmm. in these scenes, and the way that they're shot, it really is suspenseful in some ways. And yes, very much. It, it's it's a very very um, very well made film, and I, I thought that his performance was perhaps a little sleepy, but uh, you know, perhaps that's what Neil Armstrong is like—just this quiet kind of stoic guy who just you know focuses on this thing and has this core trauma from his you know the loss of his daughter that i didn't know about i didn't know right, i didn't right. know much about him as, a, as a, a person so that was kind of interesting to see how that um you know ties into thing and i don't know if that moment at the end of the film spoiler alert when they're on the moon oh they uh, make it to it, the moon they make it to the moon <laughs> uh -huh. uh, is uh <laughs> yeah i don't know do you have to say spoiler alert when it's one of, <laughs> when it's like, true story. Man, when it's one of mankind's crowning achievements <laughs> yeah uh, yeah unless you believe that stanley kubrick faked the whole thing um so uh, you know I, I i don't know if that moment is true or if that is just a filmic sort of little sentimental moment but uh, you know it'd be interesting to know if it is true it's uh interesting i, I I was wondering if Kubrick was going to come up at all in conversation and it only came yeah. up one time with a, a regular, but he and right. I have talked conspiracy theories over the years. So I don't know if that gotcha. really counts at all, but hmm. yeah, the, uh, the movie that came to mind the most to me while I was watching first man was the wrestler. Oh. Because it has that handheld kind of approach to telling the story where you don't get these sweeping shots of the crowd at the wrestling right. matches. You don't – you do get the – finally, like, the rocket, the takeoff, the countdown sequence at mm -hmm. the end when they're going to the moon. But you – like, there's one scene uh, – I think it's the Gemini mission when you're just in the – I guess the capsule, the like, uh -huh. the front of the rocket with the astronauts, with Neil Armstrong – for like six, seven minutes. It's just from their point of view. Mm -hmm. And you hear the, the rattle of all the instruments. Right. And it is just, to me, it was yeah. terrifying. I don't like it heights. I don't like confined yeah. spaces. And it conveys that sense of, you know, what it really took to physically get out into space yeah. so uniquely. I don't remember seeing that in, uh, in any previous NASA or space kind of themed movies like that. Well, I remember um, Damien Chazelle saying that he wanted to make it feel like the audience was experiencing it. And I Absolutely. think that he did a great yeah, job very of doing successful. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I did take my kids with me to watch it, and mm -hmm. they did not respond to it at all the way I did. Uh, no. I was pictured to be a bit more of like an Apollo 13 style right. uh, aesthetic to it. And this one, you know, some moments, you know, worked for them and the, the moon landing stuff worked for them. But again, like you, I didn't know that I was going to have to be dealing uh, with an emotional eight-year-old yeah. daughter seeing a child's funeral right. in the first few minutes of this movie where yeah. I was like, we had to kind of whisper through, whisper talk through that just to kind of get her like, no, no, let's stick with it. It's a good story, you know. Yeah. I hope it was a, a thoughtful conversation with your daughter afterwards, at least. It was, yes. All right. Uh, and then The Old Man and the Gun, which we also opened, mm -hmm. I was surprised. I thought, I mean, I watch film news, so do you, like pretty obsessively, and we do for the show as well. So there were a bunch of regulars that hadn't heard the Robert Redford maybe retiring story. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So they were like, oh, no way. And which they means were, that I hope you told them to start listening to the I podcast. I immediately told them about the All podcast. Right. Yes, there yes, I did. So mm -hmm. uh, I was like, you'll be informed in the future if you just tune mm -hmm. in, folks. So mm -hmm. there you go. So then uh, Old Man and the Gun is going to be – was doing very good at the theater this weekend. Uh, people really loved that movie and it is uh, – it's expanding this week to a few yeah. more of our Cleveland Cinemas locations around town. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, aren't near the Cedar Lee listening to us and you're near one of our other theaters, uh, check it yes. out there. It will be at – it will be at Chagrin for sure. In uh, art house and especially box office news this week, a uh, film we're opening on November 2nd, as of right now, Beautiful Boy opened. Mm -hmm. And as we've talked, a uh, few listeners have stuck with us through all the episodes so far. We have keep mentioning the especially box office as a way to kind of gauge whether or not you know we're going to have a hit on our hands mm -hmm. uh, here at the Cedar Lee. And this one looks like one of those that is uh, attracting quite a crowd. It played on four screens and did a per screen average of $55,000, which is yep. a pretty sizable hit for... You know, mm -hmm. uh, a per screen average there. The headlines I was reading over the weekend, though, were this is Amazon is now in the business of making movies and distributing movies. Yes. And I remembered like uh, Manchester by the Sea was like, yeah. I thought like, you know, an Amazon movie, but I guess they didn't distribute it. Last Correct. Year? They okay. you, they used to partner. They when Amazon first started producing films, they used to partner with different distributors for each film. So some of their films were distributed by Magnolia, 
Some of them were distributed by roadside attractions. So right. they would kind of partner up with different uh, kind of established distributors to work on getting their films actually played out in the theaters. But now they have their own distribution wing, their own PR people and all this stuff. So Amazon Studios is a fully like uh, functioning studio now. Mm -hmm. Studio and distributor. Yes, and distributor. Which, I mean, makes sense. That is their job in general is right. distributing yeah. things to people. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. theatrical release environment, though, is very different than just, you know, getting your package to somebody on time. Yes. A lesson that they've <laughs> learned with their previous... So they've released a few this year. They've did... Um, they've done... You Were Never Really Here, the mm -hmm. Joaquin Phoenix film, which is one of my favorite American films so far this year. And they also did Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot, the Joaquin Phoenix, right. Jonah Hill movie, and mm -hmm. Life Itself, which uh, has been... Th those those three, whether or not... Or sorry, irregardless of the quality, haven't been big hits for them. No. But uh, so the headlines seem to be like, oh, Beautiful Boy might be that first hit that Amazon right. has as a distributor, which... Um, is an interesting way to kind of measure it. I would say, you know, whether or not it's a good movie is the better way to go, but they are a company trying to make money. Sure, so they got to make, you know, these things cost millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. And their next film after Beautiful Boy, which will also be coming out at the beginning of November, is uh, Suspiria. So Suspiria, that, that will be another little test for them with uh, a very arty horror movie to see, uh, you know, on some levels it's more accessible because it's a horror genre film, but then at the True. same time, it is a very arty horror, uh, horror movie. So uh, we'll see how, how, it, how it goes. Uh, so the question I have with this particular story then is Amazon versus Netflix, where yes. as an art house theater, uh, you know, we like, I'm assuming you're in the same boat as I am. I like Amazon a lot more because they're working yes. with theaters like uh -huh. us to get their content on the big screen and see it. I'm right. really nervous with Netflix having uh, Alfonso Cuaron's Roma coming up and Martin Scorsese's Irishman. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to be that willing to work with, at least on a, a slightly more than like those four or five markets, you know, kind of they, scale to get their stuff out into theaters. Currently, they're absolutely not. So 100% uh, Amazon seems to understand that movies are movies when they play in theaters a little right. bit more. You know what I mean? So yeah. whenever uh, it adds a, a weight to them and it adds an importance to them and they seem to get that, whereas Netflix is very much about disrupting the entire industry in a way. Right. <laughs> and they uh, are less compelled to care about that. And I think the only reason they're playing them in any theaters anywhere is strictly because of the Oscar rules uh, for them to get oh, absolutely, you know, yeah. uh, potential nominations. So right now, uh, I was just having a, a conversation this weekend with John Ewing from the Cinematech uh, over our shared frustration over Netflix and their lack of wanting to play with uh, theatrical engagements. Well, at least beyond the uh, New York, LA, those big markets. Uh... Well, and it, it isn't even always New York and LA. It's some weird places too. Oh, really? So, like, yeah, it's it's strange. Yeah, there's okay. no, it's not even there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of rhyme or reason to it. And uh, he is begging and pleading to show a couple of things, and I've told him we've all but given up in, in some ways for certain, <laughs> just. For from past things, you know, so right, right. I know that we're going to be trying very hard to to play Roma. They're they're almost, they don't even really return your calls, kind of thing. Like they're just whatever. Sure, they just yeah, they, it's not their priority. They got their plan and they're they're sticking to it. I exactly. Guess. Yep. Uh, the other one of note now at the Cedar Lee, we usually kind of focus on the specialty box office because that's the type mm -hmm. of movies we show. And every once in a while, when it's a good quality Hollywood film, you know, we have Star Is Born playing right now. We're showing and First, First Man. Man. Yep. Mm -hmm. First Man seemed to get the headlines that, oh, it got third place at the box office. It only made $16 million, which is yeah. a ton of money. But it's one of those, the studio seemed like they almost went in damage control. I think it was somebody from Universal did a few interviews saying like, no, no, we believe in this movie. It's got legs. Yeah. It's going to get through the award season. It's not one of those movies that's going to dominate the box office. It's going to get good word of mouth. Um, four of the screenings I was uh, at the theater for working this weekend, you know, you're waiting to clean afterwards. And I'm always curious when the credits hit. At the Cedar Lee and at art houses, I'm sure, across the country, there will be random applause yeah. for movies as they happen. And four times there was applause at the end of the movie hmm. this weekend, which is always a good sign. Like, oh, right. people, people really connected like with this. Yep. Good word of mouth. Should be pretty strong. Should be keeping going. It has all the critics behind it. It's like 84 on Metacritic. It's 88 on Rotten Tomatoes, mm -hmm. which doesn't always translate into box office. But the audience does seem to be really responding to that. Um, yeah. And, you know, as award season kicks in, it seems like hopefully this is going to, you know, generate some of that buzz and keep going here at the theater. I, I think right now it's living in the shadow of A Star is Born, which is yeah. a film that everybody, 
this happens to us every year around Christmas time, if, especially if we open up three or four big kind of movies. Like last year, yeah. we opened up La La Land. That's all anybody wanted to see. And, right. you know, like, so it was like La La Land was the top of everybody's list. And then the other movies, they just kind of go down on the order. And so ho hopefully something stays around long enough for people to discover it. That's remember, the thing, yeah. Was it two years ago whenever Lion opened up on Christmas Day? And yeah, we had um, La La Land, Fences, and Lion. And, and Lion. Lion was the one that ended up yeah. staying the longest, right. but it was the one that people slowly caught up yeah. with and it loved. Took people, it took people the longest time because it was yeah. like the least buzzy of the ones, but then the people that saw it loved it and told everybody. So yeah. hopefully maybe First Man will fall into that category. So like looking at, um, I was looking at the the ratings for First Man, like so I knew the critics were behind it, but I hadn't checked in with it uh, to see. Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes were neck and neck there, but I was noticing the audience reviews are very different. Do you Is one of those two like a preferred favorite of yours that you go to? Like I'm not a big Rotten Tomatoes fan, but I do check in with it because I know so many people do just to yeah. know what the audience can be talking about. But I'm more of a Metacritic fan myself. I probably look at Rotten Tomatoes more than I do Metacritic, but I look at them both. Um, but Rotten Tomatoes, again, I don't like to reduce a movie back down to just a percentage. I, like I tell everybody. Oh, no, no, not even a percentage. Yeah. It's it's a full tomato or a splat. Like it's yeah, not even. <laughs> exactly. But that's what I mean. But like when people, uh, you know, everything's subjective. So right, if right. you could have. And I, I, there's certain movies that to me, like, well, if that movie, if that ended up being like in the high 40s or low 50s, I still might want to see it just based on the type of movie it is because they're not a movie that, you know, maybe it's like a big Hollywood action movie that critics just generally don't like anyway. Right, right. So something that's like in the 50s, you almost have to like grade it on that kind of curve to be like, well, then it's probably not a terrible movie, but it's not like a masterpiece. So it might be worth your time and you're just looking for a little bit of entertainment. We will be right back. We'll be discussing the new film, Free Solo, finally opening this weekend. <laughs> Free Solo, the new documentary from Jimmy Chin and Elizabeth Chai Vas... Oh, shoot. I'm going to mess up her last name so bad. Vassar Hell you, Hell you? you know, you can go on YouTube and you can type yeah, in But I didn't do it ahead of time. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, It is their uh, documentary following Alex Honnold as he becomes the first person to ever free solo climb Yosemite's 3,000. Yikes. Uh, hi, El Capitan Wall. Does it feel different to be up there without a rope? It's obviously like much higher consequence. People who know a little bit about climbing, they're like, oh, he's totally safe. And then people who really know exactly what he's doing are freaked out. I've thought about El Cap like for years and every yeah. year I'm like, that's really scary. I'll never be content unless I at least put in the effort. El Cap is the most impressive wall on Earth. It's 3,200 feet of sheer granite. It's the center of the rock climbing universe. Obviously, I get interview questions about it all the time. Oh, would you like to do that? And you're like, yes, for sure. So the reason I'm very excited to see this particular movie is it blends together a bunch of different styles of documentary that I like. It has the you know uh, character-driven documentary where mm -hmm. it follows a person who's insanely driven to accomplish a task. Yes. Um, in this case free climb a free solo climb a 3000 foot wall that doesn't to my eyes look like there's any way to grab onto the entire mm -hmm. way up but then it's also a nature documentary because he obviously has a reverence for nature and everything else but it also includes a kind of like making of as it's going right it's its own kind of behind the scenes yeah. documentary as well because um, just the filming of it alone is you, you how do you know, film it i mean how do you climb yeah. it but how do you right. film it as well mm -hmm. it's pretty impressive you know it's again a, a documentary that is definitely better to see on the big screen because this is something that is capturing huge you know vistas and the sense of vertigo that you'll get from seeing it on the big screen is much greater than oh yeah, yeah. Watching i got it, it just know. from the trailer like yeah, that trailer on the big screen my palms get sweaty watching yeah. it and it is the rare thing that it's, this is the art house film that I kind of was w not even on my radar. Like whenever we first had the date for it and I like knew what it was because I'd seen Maru and things, but it wasn't one that I would have expected to be this huge hit or that people would be chomping at the bit to see so much because, you know, Maru was not exactly a big hit and they're kind of right. similar, you know what I mean? Yeah, you yeah. think the same kind of audience or whatever, but this... Um, 
you know, we have more advanced tickets sold for yes. free solo than any other movie that I can think of. Uh, it, it already has an advanced, so, uh, advanced tickets, like a higher gross than most movies do their whole weeks that we, you know, play them. So I, I'm yeah. very confused. So if, if you're listening to this and there's a prime show that you want to come see to free solo, I might actually encourage you to go online and buy your tickets in advance because we could have some sold out shows this weekend. That's true. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, we should say, uh, Maru is, uh, Jimmy and Elizabeth's previous film that they did together, mm -hmm. they, they're almost carving out this like niche documentary subgenre yeah. of like climbing documentaries, mm -hmm. uh, which makes perfect sense, though. It's a naturally dramatic thing to film, right. which is weird, though. Watching Maru in the theater, uh, it really only occurred to me like maybe once like, oh, how did they film this? Because it has that like that oh, the IMAX uh, Everest documentary from right. years ago. It has a little bit of that that quality of, oh, how did they film it? But it's so compelling in the way they filmed it and the story they're telling that it Maru almost worked as just a narrative film to me yeah. like it's uh well it's one i'm going to reference a little bit when we get into the, our cedarly three picks this week but there's there's those types of documentaries that you're just so absorbed in the story you kind of forget that you're you know watching an actual thing happening right and i uh i'm, I'm gonna I, I think it was an episode of family guy or something like that that had some throwaway joke about um evil knievel and how you know like they would have these tv specials on uh to document someone's attempted suicide and right I feel right like, right <laughs> i feel like this film is the same way like you know you don't know like any time this person could you know could uh, you know perish and it's uh you know as a filmmaker i would think that that's a very scary thing you know what i mean yeah, yeah. that you don't know if you're setting out with the best of intentions to make yes. this beautiful film about this accomplishment, but uh -huh. ultimately the person could also fail and fail yeah. in the categoric way, and then you have a very different movie on your hands. Very different, you know? yeah. It's also, um, I thought of this movie a few times watching First Man, where there's that idea we mentioned earlier about, you know the ending. Like, right. Alex has been going around doing promotions for this yeah. movie. He made it. <laughs> he, he obviously succeeded. Yes. But every uh, review and, and uh, people I've talked to that have seen the movie say like, no, no, no. Like it is so dramatic. I'm like, oh, yeah, but you know I'm the sure ending. No, but yeah. it's still so it's dramatic. Still intense. So. Yeah. So with only one movie, we can go right into our Cedar Lee three picks this week. Uh, so each episode we pick three movies each. So actually, I guess it really is like the Cedar Lee six, but you know. <laughs> The individual, it's the Cedarly Three. <laughs> uh, based on a movie we're opening to kind of expand your cinematic rise and something else to watch that's thematically mm -hmm. tied to that movie. Uh, so this week we figured, uh, you know, it's a very driven, very obsessed character, uh, although Alex is a real person. You know, he feels this compulsion. He has to climb El Capitan and uh, be the first person to do that free solo. So we decided to look at uh, characters, documentary or fiction, that are obsessed. They're determined to accomplish a goal. I really didn't realize it when we picked this. I was like, oh, that ties in real well. This is the core drama to most movies. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's it's a hard thing to, to narrow down. So I, I decided since we were talking about a documentary, I didn't want to do more documentaries, even though there's a ton of documentaries about that. Oh, sure, sure. And then my first inkling, I always like movies about obsessed people that kind of um like tie me up tie me down where they kidnap someone sure. and like make them love you but of course those right, are right. very creepy movies yeah so, yeah <laughs> um i didn't want to pick those either so i went well with, i kind uh, of have one of those on there so that'll be represented right, a little even, bit on our list that's good well i mean uh, my uh the first one all right i'll just go into it my first sure. one this week was uh I think the most, it's both on-screen obsession and off-screen obsession that the film was even made, and the way it was made, is Werner Herzog's Fitzcarraldo. Nice. Uh, so uh, that is a film about um, a man completely obsessed with bringing opera to the, the, the jungles of South Africa, and has, as part of it, has to like <laughs> lug a, uh, a, a ship over a mountain, and Werner Herzog actually filmed them lugging this, you know... I forget how many tons uh, this steamship over a mountain. Like they did it in real, you know. I mean, actual... one ton is enough, but it was yeah, yeah more than that. Insane. So it's, it's insane. And it, it, the movie itself is beautiful, and Klaus Kinski's performance is just bonkers, like most Klaus Kinski really performance, is, yeah. But performances, but the there they, it was the movie itself. The making of it was so crazy. There's a great documentary about making the movie called Burden of Dreams, which kind of documents Herzog's kind of obsession with making yeah. this and things. Also, a quick shout out as well if you're into free solo and nature documentaries check out Herzog's uh, immense catalog of nature documentaries he's been yes. doing over the years they mm -hmm. are really good I've watched a bunch of those uh, with my kids over the years they're really well, fascinating and he has that awesome dry like German accented uh, yes. narration that he does well, which is just so comical to me is there such thing as insanity among penguins 
I try to avoid the definition of insanity or derangement. I don't mean that uh, a penguin might believe he, he or she is Lenin, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. But uh, could they just go crazy because they've had enough of their colony? I had thought about putting Grizzly Man on here. Oh, which, yeah, that would yeah, be good one. And, yeah. But then again, you know, like it's 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 one of those documentaries that, hmm, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's it's a great film though. So well, a quick mention still gets you gets it kind of on the list. There least. you go. That's the um, series three and a half. I'll uh, I'll start off with my documentary pick. This is one I kind of referenced earlier. As as I was watching it, it's done in such a fantastic way that it feels kind of like a heist movie, even though it's not at all. Um, it's Man on Wire from oh, 2008. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Directed by James Marsh. It's the story of Philippe Petit, a um, daredevil slash acrobat mm-hmm. slash obsessive crazy person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As he in 19, was it, I think it's 74. I didn't write that down. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, he in the 70s. snuck in and strung a line, a uh, tightrope line between the World Trade Center towers. Yep. And then walked it successfully. But and it's one of those, I know the end. I know mm-hmm. he did it. I know he made it. But it's a procedural kind of heist movie mm-hmm. of how did they do because they were it was totally illegal. He was not right. allowed to do it. He did not yeah. get permission. He'd... It was a kind of a gorilla tightrope stunt kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there was even a narrative film that Robert Zemeckis did yes. with Joseph Gordon Levitt uh, called The Wire. No, what was that one called? I'm drawing a total blank on that one now. Anyway, don't I... watch that one. Watch the documentary. <laughs> it's spectacular. It's 2008 uh, James Marsh film, but uh, an obsessed character who was successful in, you know, realizing his obsession the same way that uh, Alex Honnold did in Free Solo. So, um, And the next film on my list is truly one of the best films ever made. Um, it is uh, mm. Joseph Mankiewicz's uh, All About Eve from 1950. Oh, yep. uh, when I think about obsessed, uh, driven characters, you have to think about uh, yes. Eve and her, her drive to become her, her hero and uh, the great Betty Davis film. And uh, it's with Ann Baxter, both of which were nominated for Oscars. I think we talked about that in a previous episode. Yeah, yeah. But it's just, it is one of my favorite movies and it's one of those films that i hadn't seen for for years and you almost kind of resist seeing some of the the titles that you've always heard of because you're like well it can't be as good as you know right. the le- that, that its reputation is but all about eve absolutely still holds up it's wildly entertaining it's just it's a very creative beautiful awesome movie yeah, some of those classics too there's there's decades of hype you know and weight mm-hmm. behind it of like right. oh no it must be one of those films you know there's mm-hmm. a century of, of movies now and people say it's one of the best like that's yeah. a pretty High expectation to live up to. But I still say All About Eve, absolutely one of the best movies ever made. So uh, one of my – well, I'm going to go with uh, Misery I picked for one of mine. 1990 Mm -hmm. Rob Reiner film with an iconic Kathy Bates performance. Yep. I remember seeing that movie in the theater and I walked out and I said to my friend that I saw it with, I'm like, she should get an Oscar for that. She never will, but she should. Right, right. And it's not a. It's the rare thing where a yeah. horror genre movie like that gets exactly. uh, gets the Oscar attention that it did, and she rightfully won an Oscar for it because it's Absolutely. a brilliant performance. Um, well, my final one is uh, speaking of kind of crazy killers is okay. David Fincher's Zodiac, and Ooh. the obsessed character of that you could say there's kind of two. There's obviously a serial yeah. killer. All serial killers are obsessed, but really the obsessed character in that film becomes Jake Gyllenhaal yeah. uh, as the. Re- reporter uh well he's a cartoonist he's not even a reporter he's yeah. like the the local cart or the cartoonist in the paper that becomes obsessed with solving the crime like uh, and he dedicates his life and it ruins his marriage and you know everything because this becomes the central obsession in his life and if you've never seen zodiac which a lot of people haven't because it's three hours long and it's about a serial killer <laughs> yeah but yeah. it was on a lot of people's not not just best of the year list it was on a lot of critics best of the decade list um, yeah it is it is really an an amazing movie and i would highly recommend it it's worth every second of it and it's just it's a creepy beautiful weird movie with just some great performances mark ruffalo's in it and and um, jake gyllenhaal and it's it's just great all right my last one uh i didn't necessarily want to include this because i wanted to include a classic one so i'm glad you had uh fitzcarraldo and all about eve because those were kind of like penciled in on my list mm-hmm. here um but i had to go with it it's whiplash from 2014 oh, yeah uh, that's Damien a great Giselle's one. movie mm-hmm. this one i did end up picking because it's not just a driven character it's two driven characters in this one mm-hmm. and they butt heads and that creates the whole drama for the movie you've got the music teacher uh played by uh i almost just said jk rowling jk simmons <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a very different movie uh and and Miles Teller is the drummer. Mm -hmm. Uh, But so you see two very specifically driven characters. Uh, One is a teacher, one is a performer, Mm -hmm. and how 
it's insanely toxic, but it's also fruitful in a way yeah. and it's abusive and it, it ties in uh, in a very messy way, like all those different aspects of two driven characters that meet, they click, they butt heads, uh, they argue, they're antagonistic, but they also kind of bring out the best slash worst in each right. other. It's a really fascinating character study and amazing music throughout the whole movie too. If you haven't seen Whiplash, uh, you've got to see that one. Yeah, it's a great film. So feel free to uh, share with us your favorite driven or obsessed characters in documentary or fiction using the hashtag Cedarly3 so we can save you some space using the number three there to tell us about your favorite picks uh, or any of our social media platforms. We do have a few special events to inform you uh, good listeners about this coming week. We are uh, back in the season of The Met. The Met we is back. We sure so are. Second, uh, sh second title of this season, we are showing... Mm -hmm. Samson, well, this is the French title. Um, you want to take this one or? <laughs> Just say Samson and Delilah. It's Samson okay. and Delilah. <laughs> Samson and Delilah, the Met. Uh, so it'll be live on Saturday, October 20th at 1255 in the afternoon. And the Encore show, uh, as usual, is on Wednesday. Uh, this time it'll be October 24th at 630 p.m. And if you're listening to us and you're close to our Chagrin Cinemas location, Chagrin is also now carrying the Met operas, as is our Apollo Theater. So you have a couple of places you can see that at. Um, and then we're also continuing our national theater productions and this is the encore of probably the biggest one of the biggest hits between this and the audience i would say are the two yeah, biggest second hits. biggest i think um, you can't compare with uh, the dame yeah you can't you can't beat oh, wait. Helen, helen mirren it, no she's, she's a dame not, right i don't know is she damed now you can't I, compete with helen mirren let's yeah. put it that way <laughs> um and uh it is uh danny boyle's version of frankenstein featuring benedict cumberbatch and um johnny lee miller and they rotate uh the role of playing the creature and the uh, doctor and the shows that we have coming up this week Monday October 22nd and Wednesday October 24th at 7 o'clock are the ones featuring Benedict Cumberbatch as the creature. Uh, we also have a production of Funny Girl the musical starring Sheridan Smith. This was a performance on uh, you, you're, okay the, you're the Anglophile here so yes. um, London's is it's West End or is yes, it the, the East London, End? Yeah, was, it's, the, it's the West End it's the West well, End London's West production. End is their Broadway yes, district. Yes. Uh, rave reviews, stellar performance mm -hmm. um all the reviews i've read for this one are just spectacular they're praising her performance funny girl the musical is on thursday october 25th at 7 p.m yeah the fact that anybody would touch barbara streisand's funny girl and get good yeah, reviews yeah. tells you how good this is because right. everybody was gunning for it to to be a bomb and it was great right. uh and then we have for the 50th anniversary of night of the living dead where you're a part of our fathom programming we've got on wednesday october 24th at 10 o'clock and Thursday, October 25th at 7 o'clock, we've got um, uh, special screenings of Night of the Living Dead, which features an introduction from George C. Romero and Andrew Romero, not George A. Romero, because he is no <laughs> longer with us. And uh, just a little bit of Dave Huffman personal trivia. I am originally from Evan City, where Night of the Living Dead was filmed, and my grandparents, uh, Ray and Olive Huffman, are actually buried in the Night of the Living Dead uh, cemetery that you see at the beginning of the film. So, but they passed away after the film was made, so they are not zombies. Oh, so, so yeah. no cameos. But, but we're always hoping they may come back. <laughs> On next week's episode, we will be discussing uh, two new films opening at the Cedar Lee Studio 54, a documentary about Studio 54, mm -hmm. probably one of the most infamous uh, clubs of all time, at least in America. And we're also opening mid-90s, the writing and directing uh, debut for actor Jonah Hill. So inspired by Jonah Hill's directing debut and the story of mid-90s, we'll be discussing our Cedar Lee 3 picks for top coming-of-age films. Uh, hopefully that's not as broad a topic as driven and obsessed characters, <laughs> hoping for a little bit more of a manageable list. But uh, if you want to let us know what your picks might be for your favorite coming-of-age films, help us uh, in our decision-making process. You can always submit those through the uh, usual social media channels, and we will uh, let you know what our picks are on next week. Week show. Thank you so much for tuning into Cedar Lee Radio for this week. All the music heard on the show is original music written by Grant Heineman and performed by the New Heights Jazz Ensemble, used with their permission, of course. Visit clevelandcinemas.com for current up-to-date showtimes and to purchase advanced tickets, or call 440-528-0355 for current and up-to-date daily showtimes. This info is also in the show notes, as well as links to everything discussed today. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Cedar Lee Theater, spelled with an R-E at the end. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast and while you're subscribing we'd appreciate you leaving us a rating or a review better yet tell a fellow film geek about the show see you at the movies